Thank you. I pressed that one. Okay. Um, well, back to the moon. Um, and I have a lot of material to go through, so I'm going to go through a lot of it quickly, but try to dwell on the important new things that many of you have not yet seen or don't remember. Uh, we are talking about swirls, uh, and I was hoping you can at least get a, a vision of what the swirls are look like here. We're, if we have time, I'll talk about some of the spectra of the traverses that are shown here with M cubed data. Um, uh, as you know, swirls are associated with magnetic anomalies on the moon, and this turns out to be very key for the properties of the swirls. Not all magnetic uh, uh, anomalies have swirls, but swirls are associated with magnetic, magnetic anomalies. Um, there are several hypotheses for swirl formation. Um, one has to do with comet interactions. One has to do with solar wind deflection from the magnetic fields, perhaps uh, preventing space weathering. There is dust mobility and redistribution hypotheses. And the, a more recent one about the, the inhibition of the fairy castle structure within the swirls themselves. Um, my hypotheses are that, although I can't comment on the comet, so, so that's right now off the table. However, it's clear there is solar wind deflection around these magnetic anomalies. However, I want to make sure people leave here recognizing it does not prevent space weathering. Um, the other two pa parts that I'll be emphasizing is the dust mobility in the magnetic environment and redistribution of materials. And I'll mention a little bit, if I have time, about the fairy castle structure. The key topics I want to identify, or at least touch on, so that uh, those of you who are, who are or are not familiar with these uh, uh, leave with some sense of this, that uh, the space weathering environment associated with swirls, swirls are not immature. Swirls are not immature. Um, I do want to touch on the optical properties of the finest fraction. That does have relevance to here, and we do have measurements on that. I want to, more importantly, uh, identify or talk about some of the magnetic properties of uh, weathered lunar soils. And that, I believe, now is, is one of the key uh, components to understanding. Um, I'll touch on the magnetic character as they determine on the regolith, uh, re referencing some recent modeling that's been done. OK, uh, quick review of space weathering on, in the lunar environment. You are all, I think, familiar by now that um, lunar materials in, uh, in the uh, natural environment have beautiful absorption bands. We all love these. This is what M cubed measures, highly diagnostic. However, when you look at soils, these features are highly subdued. Uh, the, the soils do not look like nice ground up rocks. That's both true in the laboratory as well as in, as in the remote measurement, say if you look at a fresh crater and surrounding soils. So we know materials are altered in the space environment. And we know uh, what the, this alteration produces. Namely, it lowers the albedo, at least in the visible, not necessarily in the near infrared. But it lowers the albedo in the visible. Um, it's, it significantly uh, uh, diminishes the absorption band strengths. Um, and you have a very distinctive near infrared continuum that is highly diagnostic of of the space of the lunar type of space weathering, and that ends up being very important in our discussion for swirls as well. Uh, we also know that these three properties now are controlled by the development of the nanophase iron that uh, accumulates as materials weather in the space environment. Uh, as you, if you were listening to Larry's talk earlier today, you recognize that this also provides a magnetic component, and that's something we're going to come back to in our discussion today. OK, quick a review of some of the finest, the, uh, finer, uh, the finest fraction of uh, the soils. We've, we have a suite of these that are well measured. We have the composition, the mineralogy, the spectroscopy. Uh, they have a very well-defined pattern. There's a series of papers that have been published on these by both Noble et al. and Taylor et al. Um, uh, you're welcome to, to review these at your leisure. Point is that they're very systematic, and the finest fraction have characteristics that are distinctive from the more coarse grain faction, which contains more of the uh, stronger mineral uh, features. Um, uh, Sarah Noble did some excellent um, experiments identifying some of the characteristics of what we see in the fine fraction, linking them to this nanophase iron. 
And what's important is that it's not just the presence of the nanophase iron, both the size of the nanophase iron and the relative abundance. You don't get one size fits all, but both the abundance and the size of the nanophase iron makes a very important, um, uh, uh, imprints a very important property on the character of the, the specific soils or even the fraction of the soils that you're measuring. Um, this is the same thing, except that now it's scaled so that you can see these properties. Some are some are are very linear, some are curved, and that's dependent on the relative abundance. And this is only a fraction of a percent. These are tiny amounts, remember. Okay. Um, uh, some of you probably don't know that we have measured the very finest, finest, finest fraction. Um, this was um, some work that Dave McKay started several years ago. Um, it's now in press. Uh, Bonnie Cooper has carried this project forward. Um, and in the very finest fraction, and for those of you who can read it, the blue curve is now um, a little less than one micron in size. So we, th this, this whole sequence that we saw in the uh, soil consortium carries even to the very finest fractions and is quite consistent with what we know from, from the, the sequence. So there's really some wonderful data on extremely fine properties of lunar soils. And it's all linked to this nanophase iron. Uh, this is just to say that this uh, sample that was measured by McKay et al. is very typical of what we've seen in the rest of the soil consortium measurements. Okay, now, here's something that you probably don't remember. And I want to echo Larry's uh, comment earlier today. This is some data that is 40 years old now, done by Adams and McCord in 1973. They measured a series of lunar soils. They did magnetic separates of these soils. This was when we were trying to understand space weathering. And they said, aha, we've got it. It's the magnetic component. And so they measured the, the bulk soil, the, the magnetic component, the non-magnetic component. And it seemed to make sense. And they got beat up because petrologists said, no, that doesn't represent the soil. The magnetic component has other stuff in it. The non-magnetic component has the glutinates in it. So it sort of went away, but there's a wonderful data set, and it's extremely relevant today. Um, a quick aside, we, we have measured this particular soil in the soil consortium, and it is comparable to all the other things we've been seeing, so it's, it's a good soil. Um, but if you look at the magnetic components, um, uh, the, the blue one, the top that's steeper, is the highly magnetic. The flatter one that's ready, if you can see it, is the non-magnetic component. So right away, you can be thinking, OK, put this in a magnetic environment. What's going to happen? Well, we'll talk about it. Very quickly now, I'm going to show you some data from M-Cube. We've measured, uh, because we have the full spectrum, we can measure the albedo. We can measure the continuum slope. We can measure the absorption band strength. If you want to know how we do that, I refer you to a paper by Morardi et al. I've got backup slides if you want to see it. But I'm going to show you images that show you the distribution of the albedo, the band strength, and the continuum slope. And this, for a variety of swirls, and we'll just run through them, they're all consistent in their properties. OK, here we'll start with Ingenie, one of the most beautiful ones on the far side. Um, uh, you see the albedo. See continuum slope. Notice the scale here for continuum slope. If it's a flatter continuum slope, it's dark. If it's a steeper continuum slope, it's bright. You can see the anti-correlation between albedo and continuum slope readily. Band depth is over in the corner there. Uh, you don't see any relationship between band depths and the swirls. It's minuscule, if at all. The continuum slope and albedo are correlated, but the band depth is not. We can also measure band center, but I'm not going to talk about that. That's the composition, but we don't have time for that. I'll walk through. Here's the Descartes. Again, the same thing. Uh, correlation between uh, albedo and continuum slope. No signature with band depth. Reiner Gamut's our favorite. This is the one case, especially with the head, the main body of the Reiner gamma, um, does have a, a link with uh, uh, band strength. Not as strong as it should be, but nevertheless, there's some. However, if you look at some of the more um, uh, delicate parts of the swirl, and we'll zero in on that box there, 
um, again, you come back to this uh, continuum slope and, and um, albedo correlation, but lack of correlation with the band strength. Um, Marginus, beautiful uh, suite here, high correlation between the albedo continuum slope. In fact, you can see the anti-correlation uh, for this particular image there. The, and the lack of correlation between albedo and band strength over in the corner there. Uh, these are beautiful examples. Um, one of, well, Jerry Asimovich, same thing. You can see the little swirls up at the top, correlation with the continuum slope and lack of correlation with the band uh, strength. There's another interesting aspect of this particular area. There's a, a impact melt that streaks across to the, to the west there that is in part of the, the, the strong band strength uh, aspect there. Separate story. OK. My favorite is Airy. Um, um, uh, this uh, has a beautiful pattern. Again, you see the same thing, two independent measurements, correlation with albedo and continuum slope, and lack of correlation, complete inconsistent correlation with the band strength. Um, there's some beautiful modeling that Ian Garrett Bethel and, his, and uh, Doug Hemingway did. Um, a, looking at the details of the magnetic field and hypothesizing the vertical is associated with the dark lanes, and the horizontal component is associated with the bright periods. When they modeled this and, and got close up, it fits the airy very nicely. Um, and again, just going back to what we see, everything's beautifully consistent, magnetic field, bright lanes, dark lanes, um, uh, in terms of the character of the magnetic field. Um, OK, uh, I'm not going to have time to go through all these, but let me just walk through some spectra, pointing out that the traverse across the swirl shown on your left compared to a traverse with a fresh crater in surrounding soil are completely different. Um, this is true for every series. The swirl, high albedo, low albedo is completely different from the maturity transducy in, in natural uh, unswirl materials. OK. so. Swirls are fundamentally different. They are brighter at all wavelengths. They have a flatter continuum. They do not follow the space weathering trend. Um, the hypothesis um, is basically that this, there is soil wind def uh, deflection. However, there is normal space weathering. Um, however, as you can sense from my emphasis on the magnetic components of soils, if you put normal space weathered material in a magnetic environment, loft them a little bit with the kinds of dust lofting that, that was seen by Laddie, you will get separation of the magnetic component and the non-magnetic component, just in the manner that we see at the swirls. Um, oh, if you don't know what a fairy castle structure looks like, by the way, I tried to make a little sketch. Here's a fairy castle structure and a lack of fairy castle structure. We probably need this to get the forward scattering at swirls, a lack of, for, of fairy castle structure. And if you remove those little black dots um, by magnetic separation, it also makes it brighter. So you, you see where this is going. Here's the model. This is my last slide. OK. Swirls do not, do not, do not uh, follow the common space weathering uh, uh, sequence that we see elsewhere on the moon. Um, the character of the regular that swirls is affected very prominently by the magnetic field in which it resides. And the current model really combines all these things. It now makes perfect sense. Um, normal space weathering does occur in these environments. However, um, in other words, development of nanophase iron occurs. However, as you loft a few of these particles, they those that are in some locations, namely with the horizontal uh, magnetic field, are mobilized and are deposited where you have vertical uh, magnetic fields. So it's a, it's a natural size, uh, not size sorting, magnetic sorting of the basic character of lunar soils. Um, so you have a little bit of dust mobility. You have uh, normal space weathering. Probably needs a lack of fairy castle to get the forward scattering properties. But there you have it. And I made my time. Thank you. Questions? OK. Tim, in the back. Um,
Can I, I just um, wanted to make sure I understood one thing that you mentioned. You said that you do think the solar wind is being deflected, but that is not having an effect That's on right. the space weather. So, That's right. It's not. It's insignificant. It's, so, yeah. So, so solar wind implantation, sputtering, all these things that have been you know talked about in the literature for years that has no, no effect on space weathering. Is that what this model is saying? Now? Yeah. One thing that people there's two things relative to that. People will say, well, no, it's not completely protected. Some gets through. No one has ever claimed these magnetic fields do a pure deflection. That's one. The second is you don't need hydrogen to get nanophase iron. The experiments have shown that. So in both cases, it doesn't matter. Okay. Can I just have one more real quick question? Are there experiments or models to show that the magnetic fields at these swirls are strong enough to get the kind of magnetic separation that you're hypothesizing? Uh, uh, that's a good point, and I don't know. I do know that in the laboratory, it's easy to separate the magnetic component out with you know, a little magnet. Uh, John Adams did it a nice sort of settling kind of experiment with, with a large number of soils, and they're all available at the lab. I don't know, I, since I'm not a magnetics person, I don't know if what, what you have on the surface is strong enough. Part of our problem, and we need a rover or an experiment to do this, we don't know exactly what it is on the surface because, of course, it's measured at a high altitude. Yeah, you, oh, right first there. Um, is the amount of mobility you need reasonable? Um, I, I believe so, and uh, the, the key is to be able to get something lofted. And originally, we were worried about the LADI measurement, saying, oh, we don't see any lofting. However, as Mihai showed earlier, you get some just by natural stirring, you know, natural little bombardment. So you get particles at a high altitude. Uh, and if you get that on a regular basis, um, and these have been sitting around for millions, billions of years, um, all you need is just a regular manner with a, with a clear magnetic field that will gradually sort it out. I don't know how long it takes to sort it out, um, um, but we've got lots of time to, to spend. Are there magnetic areas that do not have swirls? Um, y yes. Um, and let me answer the question you probably are going to ask then. Um, and, and this I, I need to toss back to the modelers. Um, the pattern that uh, uh, Hemingway and Aaron Gath Garrett Bethel um, modeled was horizontal and vertical components um, associated with the dark lanes and the bright lanes. Um, there are some things like the Descartes, which is just a big blob. There's none swirly things. So I'm, I, I suspect, but I, there's no way I can prove it, it has to do with the orientation of whatever is magnetic. You know, how big is it? Where, how far is it buried? Um, these are things that we don't have any handle on right now. And I don't know if we can derive them from orbit or if we really have to do that on the surface. One more quick one and an equally quick answer. <laughs> this is just mainly a comment, but uh, it's, I think in terms of space weathering, it's important to keep in mind that energetic particles um, you know, are a very important component of the space weathering. And uh, the magnetic fields and most magnetic anomalies, in fact, all that we've seen, are not strong enough to prevent the, the penetration of energetic particles. So that's a component of space weathering that's going to be there, you know, all the time inside these mag magnetic anomalies. Yes, except the energetic particles won't necessarily make the nanophase iron. They might do the sputtering or, or vaporization, it, but it's the magnetic iron, the nanophase iron, that, that basically sets this whole concept of swirls in. in OK, well, let's thank our speaker again. We should talk again. about that.